Ladies and gentlemen, welcome here at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. My name is Wolfgang Knöbel. I'm the director of this institute. And it is my duty and my pleasure at the same time to introduce you to tonight's speaker and to moderate the discussion after the lecture by Susanna Narodsky. The topic of this evening has something to do with Spain and the political situation in Spain. And for those of you who have been visiting the lectures here at the HIS in the last few months, this topic doesn't come as a surprise because we already had, most of the time in cooperation with the Instituto Cervantes, guest speakers who, for example, dealt with Francoism as an emotional regime or who gave us insights into the long and complex history of Spanish nationalism. Now it is obvious that Spain and the history of Spain are themes which are interesting in themselves, but the history of most or even all nations is certainly interesting in some respects. So that alone doesn't give us a good justification or legitimation to particularly deal with this country in the southwest of Europe. The reasons why we, the scholars here at the HIS, are so keen to learn more about Spain have a much more systematic background. And they, firstly, have to do with the fact that the social sciences still develop their theories from a metropolitan point of view. Most so-called Western social scientists still believe that the view from London, Paris, Berlin, or New York City is the only reasonable and possible one. The most important processes and trends within modernity are presumably those to be experienced or detected at the center and those in the periphery are only of secondary importance. This ethnocentric perspective, obviously, is highly problematic because it not only gives us a false account of the things going on outside of Europe, it also gives us a wrong idea what Europe actually is. It tends to hide the inner diversity of this entity called Europe and, above all, tends to camouflage the huge power differences between different regions in Europe and the dependencies of many of those regions from the European center. Secondly, this ethnocentric perspective of the social sciences must not be neglected for the simple reason that these disciplines are oftentimes much more influential than most of us believe. One often tends to smirk about the uselessness of social scientific knowledge about the secondary status of the humanities in contrast to the importance of the sciences and, in more general terms, about the powerlessness of academia in comparison to the power position of economic enterprises and military institutions. But one must not forget that the paradigms of the social scientists, sciences and the humanities have become part of the worldview of non-academics as well oftentimes very powerful laypersons such as politicians and bureaucrats who more or less unconsciously build their activities and strategies on presumably common knowledge, a knowledge that in the end has its roots in the sometimes correct, sometimes highly dubious theoretical constructions of social scientists. No wonder, therefore, that the conflicts within the European Union, those that we have seen since the financial crisis of 2008, are oftentimes those between the center and the periphery, conflicts which certainly have something to do with diverging interests, but which are also based on different historical and sociological interpretations of processes which have been and still are going on in Europe. And thirdly, the scholars of the HIS are particularly interested in Spain because at least some of them believe that the future of the European Union will be decided in the southern countries of Europe. And this is not so much because of the so-called refugee crisis, the fact that these countries are closest to those regions where the ref refugees come from, a fact not to be neglected, to be sure. Much more important, however, seems to be the insight that the countries of southern Europe do have a different political economy. And this alone will always create tensions within a European framework that is dominated by a country such as Germany with a completely different economic structure. And on this prob problem, among others, the HIS research group on statehood and democracy is currently working on. This brings me 
to our guest tonight, Susanna Narotsky from the University of Barcelona, who is at the same time one of the newly elected advisory board members of the HIS. Susanna Narotsky was raised and educated in Spain and France, and her cosmopolitan background is somewhat mirrored in her truly inter and, inter and transdisciplinary education. She got her first degree in 1982 in geography and history at the University of Barcelona, did her Master of Arts at the New School for Social Research in New York, got another MA degree again in Barcelona, wrote her PhD thesis in political and social science again at the New School in 1990 on the topic Ideas that Work, Ideologies and Social Reproduction in Rural Catalonia and Beyond. Immediately afterwards, she became first assistant professor and then associate professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid before she got an offer from the University of Barcelona, where she now, since 2006, is catedratico, in German, presumably, Lehrstuhlinhaberin. Susanna's main interests are in the fields of economic anthropology. She has published widely on topics such as work and labor, on women and work, on the informal economy, on rural regions, etc. There's no way to highlight all of her publications. The list is much too long. Therefore, I would like to mention one book by Susanna written together with Gavin Smith, Immediate Struggles, People, Power and Place in Rural Spain, published 2006 at the University of California Press. This book I would like to recommend not only for the simple reason that it is a very good book on the process of industrial restructuring in the province of Alicante. I would also like to mention that this is a book of a type we admire here at the HIS because it combines in a very innovative way not only fieldwork and the collection of numerous diverse data and materials, it also gives the reader a thorough historical account of the changes going on in that province in the southwest of Spain since the times of Franco. And last but not least, it doesn't refrain from engaging in theoretical discourse by, for example, criticizing social science concepts such as social capital, which have been so influential at least since Robert Putnam's work on Italy. One last word. Susanna Narotsky, from 2011 to 2013, also the president of the European Association of Social Anthropologists, on numerous occasions got enormous amounts of money in order to lead empirical research projects, money from very prestigious institutions both in Spain and in Europe. One of those projects on grassroots economies has just been completed, if I understood it correctly, but another one, at least as big as this one, has already been started. Tonight, however, she will present us something from another corner of her fields of interest. She will talk about the more recent nationalist mobilization in Catalonia. The title of her talk will be Evidence Struggles, Legality, Legitimacy, and Social Mobilizations in the Catalan Political Conflict. And I'm sure that her lecture will give us evidence enough why Susanna is regarded as one of the most interesting and innovative social anthropologists today. Please welcome Susanna Narotsky. So thank you, thank you very much, um, Volgan. Uh, I think you maybe have uh, overdone the, my presentation because I think uh, now you know everybody's like uh, expecting <laughs> fantastic things, and I'm I'm not sure I can deliver. But anyway, I, I'll do my best. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you, uh, thank especially Professor Wolfgang Nobel uh, and the Hamburg Institute uh, for Social Research for having invited me um, to share uh, some of my uh, research uh, with you all. And I also thank you for having uh, been able to come today and uh, maybe 
um, participate in some of the discussion uh, later on. Um, what I'm going to present here is very much uh, what we would call uh, um, ethnography at home. So I basically uh, live uh, in uh, uh, Catalonia, in uh, Barcelona. I've been raised in, uh, in uh, this city, uh, although I've, I wasn't born there and I have a very kind of mixed uh, background. Um, but uh, but I, I'm living this reality that I'm going to present you um, uh, in the everyday uh, kind of experience. So uh, that also, uh, you know, uh, um, points to a particular uh, position uh, of, I mean, I'm trying to just show you my position within uh, the uh, knowledge field that I'm trying to present here. Um, so what I'm, I really, the point of this lecture is, uh, is trying to uh, show how uh, there is a, an, an, what I call an evidence struggle. So different uh, agents uh, in this um, political conflict are trying to produce different kinds of evidence and are trying to uh, um, set the basis uh, of their arguments for their political position and for their claims in, uh, in particular kinds of evidence. So I'm, I'm going to try to, um, to show that, but I, I also, um, ask you to be a little bit forgiving because it's it's very complex and and sometimes I will get into describing events um, and uh, and uh, I hope it doesn't get too boring. Um, so um, okay, sorry. Uh, so anyway, um, the. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the ongoing Catalan political conflict is historically deep and has many iterations. The present one is occurring in the context of a general rise of nationalist mobilizations in Europe following austerity policies implemented by neoliberal regimes, especially after the 2008 financial crisis. Starting in 2010, the conflict of the Catalan and Spanish nationalist governments has acquired momentum and developed into a full-fledged institutional crisis. The central Spanish government's arguments are mostly of a juridical nature and rest on the alleged anti-constitutionality of the actions of members of the Catalan government and of mostly, mainly, two uh, civil society organizations, Omnium and uh, Asamblea Nacional uh, Catalana. These are the two civil society uh, organizations, and they are very important and very powerful in the uh, sustaining and producing uh, uh, the performativity of, uh, of a certain, uh, certain evidence which is performative. Um, instead, Catalan supporters of independence rest their arguments on historical grievances referring to national institutions, fiscal inequity, identity, and on the legitimacy of their claims. Independent supporters, with the help of major civil society associations, those two that I mentioned, have mobilized hundreds of thousands of Catalans in massive demonstrations that perform popular will. This lecture argues that an important aspect of the political confrontation is being played as an evidence struggle where the various social actors produce different kinds of evidence to justify their actions in the political arena and mobilize support. Evidence is used to make a legal case and includes direct and circumstantial forms of evidence. 
Historical evidence is used to make a moral case beyond legality and stress legitimacy. Finally, symbolic evidence is performatively produced so as to incite emotional support. In the struggle for power and resources tied to territorial and cultural justification, these evidence struggles have saturated the political arena in such a way that other struggles are now invisible. So the 1978 Spanish um, Constitution uh, that was drawn after the end of the dictatorship instituted a governance structure uh, based on uh, autonomous communities. Uh, after a brief symbolic return from exile of the last president of the Catalan Autonomous Government, which is called the Generalitat, uh, and this return from exile, this person was called uh, Tarradellas, and he was a member of the uh, Republican left uh, and had been... Uh, the last you know, president um, uh, with the Republic and was the president in exile uh, during the Francoist regime. So he returned briefly to Catalonia after, um, during the transition. And after him, Catalonia had a nationalist conservative president for 23 years. Uh, and in fact, this president was afterwards indicted for huge corruption schemes. Uh, but he, before that, he was like a kind of symbol uh, of uh, um, the autonomous community. In 2003, however, a coalition of left parties came into power in the Generalitat. One of their main projects was to propose a new estatut. The estatut is the autonomy charter of uh, this uh, autonomous community. Uh, a new estatut that would enlarge the devolution of power to Catalan institutions, especially in juridical and fiscal domains. Those, those were the two main domains where the new estatut wanted to enlarge uh, devolution. The Catalan Parliament debated the new Estatut uh, for a year, and in 2006, it was approved. It was approved by the Catalan Parliament. Uh, it was then amended and approved by the Sp Spanish Parliament, but the National Conservative Party, Partido Popular, then in the opposition, opposed it and took it to the Constitutional Court. There, the Estatut was thoroughly examined and eventually truncated in a ruling that deleted various articles and restrictively interpreted others. The ruling of the Constitutional Court was pronounced on June 2010, and this is significant you know, for what happened uh, afterwards. Uh, the main changes in the ruling opposed the status of Catalonia as a nation, limited, to, uh, limited the creation of a separate judicial system and restricted fiscal decisions, and insisted on the co-official status of Spanish uh, as a language in Catalonia. This is the uh, estatut, the... the um, um, you know, reform the Estatut after the Constitutional Court ruling, uh, that this is the Estatut currently in place, which nevertheless allows for a very ample autonomy. As a result of the Constitutional Court's decision, on July 10, 2010, so uh, just 12 days after the ruling, a massive demonstration under the slogan Som una nació y nosaltres decidim, we are a nation and we decide, took place in Barcelona. The term nation, I have a photograph that I will show you later of this massive uh, demonstration. The term nation, 
Nació, has been interpreted by the Constitutional Court ruling as excluding sovereignty. So the Constitutional Court ruling leaves the word, the term nation, in the Estatut, but interprets it in a way that restricts, the, uh, restricts its meaning. Uh, and, you know, uh, basically what it does, it, 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 it uh, sidelines the sovereignty part of nation. So uh, the use of nació in the original Estatut of 2006, however, was clearly aimed at establishing the substance of a right to a sovereign state. It sought to supersede the term nacionalidad, nationality, that had been negotiated and accepted in the Spanish Constitution of 1978 to refer to the historical autonomous communities. And here I have to clarify, because it's a little bit confusing, um, and um, what you need to uh, know is that the Constitution, the uh, Spanish Constitution, differentiates between regions that had earned the status of autonomous communities before the dictatorship, so that is during the Republic, uh, and those that had not. And only the former, those that had that status before the dictatorship, were described as nationalities uh, and were defined as historical autonomous communities. For many, the ruling of the Constitutional Court on the Estatut was the beginning of the present troubles. But let's take a closer look at the evidence, uh, at the wider context, however. And here, uh, I want to, you know, show you the wider context. The financial crisis that started in 2008 was striking, uh, uh, was striking hard by 2010. Unemployment skyrocketed and mortgage evictions created housing emergency when the housing bubble burst. The bailing out of banks resulted in public service and welfare cuts that mobilized large protest movements. And here I'm, I'm going to show you, I mean, these mobilizations, well, this is the uh, 15M. So here we have one of the first uh, uh, mobilizations uh, in defense of public uh, services and against uh, the cuts, no? And this is before the Indignados movement, just the day before, in fact, uh, the, uh, in, before the occupation of the plazas. So this was going on uh, all the time. And what's important to note is that the new conservative government of Catalonia, so the autonomous government, that came into power in November of 2010, was at the forefront of these structural adjustment measures. Artur Mas, a conservative neoliberal, became president and immediately implemented important austerity cuts in health, education, and social services. Um, also, we have to know that his uh, minister of economy was a very, very um, uh, staunch neoliberal uh, who had been, um, who was one of the, called Chicago Boys. He had uh, uh, studied under Friedman. Uh, so protests against austerity through Spain culminated in the 15M Indignados movement of 2011. Demonstrations spread from the initial occupation of Puerta del Sol in Madrid and Plaza de Catalunya in Barcelona. The later occupation, this one, the, this one is the Catalan occupation in Plaza Catalunya in Barcelona, was violently repressed by the Mossos de Esquadra, which is the Catalan police, on May 27, following orders from the Catalan government. This was the first violent eviction of the Indignados movement, and it happened in Catalonia. During 2011 and 2012, many, many massive demonstrations against austerity 
occurred all over Spain and very especially in Catalonia in support of public health and education. Not only in Catalonia, also very much in Madrid and other parts of Spain, but in Catalonia they were huge. And here you have uh, several of them. April uh, 2011, um, uh, a demonstration against public uh, uh, the cuts in public health. This one is a very interesting photograph where you can see um, the uh, young indignados uh, uh, who had uh, been kicked out of the uh, Plaza Catalunya a few months before. They are surrounding the Catalan Parliament, uh, which is dominated by the now very nationalist. Uh, um, uh, uh, party uh, of, uh, um, now it's not called Convergencia Union, but anyway, that's not, you know, important. Uh, but basically, uh, they are protesting uh, the austerity cuts that the Catalan government is implementing. So here, uh, the uh, antagonist is the Catalan government. Uh, and in fact, the president had to come uh, to arrive into the parliament by helicopter because he couldn't, you know, enter. Here we have another uh, big demonstration, January 2012, another one, April 2012, uh, May 2012. This is the 1st of May. And as you can see, there are no Catalan independence flags in any of these demonstrations, you see. They are just anti-austerity demonstrations. And I, I really want to highlight this because if, if you look at the chronology later, and I'm going to show you the chronology, uh, it's, in my opinion, you know, very obvious why this whole uh, nationalistic discourse came into place. So here we have more, and um, here we have one, the students, May 3, 2012, the students against the hike of, uh, um, of the um, higher education tuition fees, uh, and here I have a last one, November 11 of uh, 2012, okay. So, uh, all of this was uh, uh, happening, uh, and uh, in this conjuncture of popular mobilizations against austerity, uh, that, I mean, these, these demonstrations uh, were claiming for constitutionally protected welfare entitlements, the conservative Catalan government voiced a growing support to independence and the national issue became hegemonic in the media. Uh, the media, uh, in uh, the Catalan media, um, is uh, very um, uh, controlled by the government. In the meantime, the Catalan Minister of Economy aggressively pursued austerity policies. Cuts to public services were justified with the argument that Catalonia had a fiscal deficit with the state. Madrid steals from us. Madrid and Roba, no? Has been the slogan. So now I want to um, show, I mean, talk about institutional, what I call institutional evidence, which is the making of a political case by uh, mostly uh, independence parties, uh, pro-independence parties in Catalonia, and also by the uh, uh, legitimately elected representatives of these parties in uh, the Catalan parliament. So it's very much uh, an institutional thing. Uh, institutional uh, declarations defending the right to self-determination became increasingly frequent after 2012, and if you look at the chronology, it really makes, you know, it's, it's very parallel to uh, the huge mobilizations, uh, anti-austerity mobilizations. So suddenly there is all these institutional declarations defending the right to self-determination, um, agreements, declarations, committees, referendums, plebiscitary elections, proliferate and saturate the political environment with the unique issue of independence, what we call el monotema. No? It's only independence, in the yes or no, but it's like 
uh, uh, present everywhere all the time and it, it's the only thing that is political, apparently. So all the rest has disappeared uh, uh, under this um, proliferation. No? And the actions create political evidence, especially when they are enacted by elected representatives in the Catalan parliament and appear as policy. I mean, many of these uh, uh, here, I'm not going to go over these because it's, uh, there are so many of them, but you can see the ones in red are more important, so to speak. Uh, and um, many of them are, are uh, um, uh, are decisions or, or, or resolutions taken by the parliament, so by the majority of uh, the parliament, uh, so they are uh, policy uh, in, a, in, in a certain way, you know, or they are policy. I mean, whether they are anti-constitutional or no, no uh, can be debatable, but they, uh, they are uh, policy. Many of these documents uh, and acts will also provide legal evidence to the prosecutors of the judicial case later on. So we will see that, uh, that this um, becomes important uh, in the judicialization of the conflict. This is the apex of the institutional conflict. Uh, and basically here is uh, all that happened in 2017. Uh, and and uh, although although all of this you know comes from all this process that uh, we've seen here, all these declarations of different kinds, um, basically uh, this is the huge uh, the moment of the bursting of the conflict really. And I want to highlight the first. Uh, the September 6, 7, 2017, uh, when the Catalan Parliament approves the referendum law and the transition law against the advice of the Committee of Statutory Guarantees, uh, that is the committee that, that, um, that uh, sees, sees to it that there isn't anything against the Estatut so the, the law, the Catalan law, and uh, also it was approved against the um, advice of the jurists of the Catalan parliament. But this is the, uh, s the main issue, uh, the main conflict, the main institutional conflict. Then, you know, there, uh, there was a referendum, etc. cetera, uh, but everything happens starts here, really. I mean, the juridical case the, uh, starts then. Uh, so in October uh, 1st, as you well know, uh, you will know there was a referendum and the question asked was, do you want Catalonia to be an independent state in the form of a republic? Uh, and Obviously, uh, many uh, believe that the referendum uh, was, mm, you know, uh, the right of you know, self-deciding uh, 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 about self-determination, um, uh, but many also uh, thought that this referendum did not have procedural guarantees, uh, and in fact, it, it did not. You know, it was a little bit of a mess. Um, to many, it was an expression of the will to act beyond the rule of law. The Catalan police was ordered to prevent the voting by requ requisitioning ballot boxes, preventing printing and distribution of ballots, and blocking the opening of polling stations. At the same time, they were put under the command of the national police, uh, who were sent to Catalonia together with the civil guard, uh, as uh, allegedly support to the Catalan police. Um, it was very badly taken by the Catalan government, who saw this as an interference um, by the central state. People went to vote and tried to prevent the police from closing the polling stations and taking the ballot boxes, defending the right to vote. Repression was violent and some Im images became viral. 
The referendum results include a turnout of 43%. Um, I think I have, oh, okay, no, I have it later on. Um, uh, a turnout of 43%, uh, a 90% of yes, 7% of no. The Catalan government considered this a resounding victory, and it was in a certain way, that ratified the mandate to pursue the path towards independence. On October 10th of 2017, the president of the Generalitat, Carles Puigdemont, unilaterally declared independence, but immediately suspended it. That same day, however, pro-independence parties registered a resolution in the Catalan Parliament that certified Catalan independence and stated the beginning of the constituent process and the application of the transition law. The then president of Spain, Mariano Rajoy, from the Conservative Popular Party, asked for a clarification as to whether independence had been declared or not. Receiving no response on October 21st of 2017, he considered that it had been declared in a way, and he activated Article 155 of the Constitution that suspends the autonomy of a region. So the Catalan government um, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, uh, intervened, so to speak, by the Spanish uh, uh, government. The president of the Spanish government dissolved the Catalan parliament and called for elections to be held on December 21st. The election results were again presented by the pro-independence parties as a plebiscite for independence. And uh, these elections gave a majority of 70 seats uh, out of 135 to the pro-independence parties with a total of 47% of votes. So there is a, 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 a difference between the votes and the seats, which favors uh, the, um, the pro-independence parties, and we will see why in a, in a minute. Uh, how, how long do I have? Yeah? Okay. Uh, in the meantime, the juridical process against those responsible for the unilateral referendum and the declaration of independence started. Some were committed to preventive detention, some flew into exile, and some were released with bail pending trial. The investigating judge charged them with the crimes of rebellion, sedition, disobedience, and misappropriation of public funds, depending on who they were. No? on their responsibility. Uh, so now I want to talk about the judicialization of politics, about how uh, there is, a, you know, this shift towards making a legal case on the part of the uh, Spanish government, of the central um, government. In the open conflict that confronts citizens and institutions around the right of secession of Catalonia, the legal question is paramount. For some, the repeated anti-constitutional actions of Catalan institutions are a dangerous attack to the rule of law that require a juridical response. For others, these actions are only an expression of a political problem that can only be resolved through negotiation and agreements. Those that support the latter interpretation point to the negative aspects of a judicialization of politics. That's how they uh, speak of this. Where political actors are charged and taken to court or worse, imprisoned for their political legitimate deeds. They claim that a political conflict between the Catalan nation and the Spanish state is being shifted to the juridical arena through the constant appeal to the Spanish constitution and the constitutional court. Those supporting this position uh, underscore grievances and present factual evidence of a political character uh, 
the fiscal deficit of Catalonia in relation to the state, the lack of investment in infrastructures, um, and the interference with the education system uh, in detriment of uh, Catalan language immersion. In the present conjuncture, however, the accusation of judicialization has become central to the development of the conflict between Catalan sovereign pa uh, sovereignty partisans and the state. Indeed, the state has repeatedly refused dialogue in terms of accepting a binding referendum of self-determination. Instead, it underscores the evidence that a number of Catalan representatives, including the president, vice president, president of the Catalan parliament, and members of government, and civil society leaders, have committed illegal acts. They are individually <coughs> responsible then for the charges of rebellion, sedition, disobedience, and misappropriation of public funds. The juridical evidence is based on existing documents, and I here you know, present one of, of these documents, uh, that prove the intention and organization of secession. Uh, for example, this is a declaration. There is also the uh, white uh, book um, uh, of the national transition of Catalonia that was... Uh, um, um, written uh, uh, on the, the uh, um, because the Generalitat had, you know, uh, uh, commissioned it. Um, it is also based on the illegal actions of the parliamentary sessions of September 6 and 7, basically the law of referendum and the law of transition, on the actions that enabled the illegal referendum to take place, and on the actions and documents unilaterally declaring independence after the results of the uh, referendum. The use of juridical arguments, however, is not limited to the state system. The party supported, supporting a Catalan right to decide also appealed to the fundamental rights of self-determination of a people where the main difficulty here hinges on the definition of people. Uh, the jurists and politicians writing the white book, this one, uh, on the national transition of Catalonia, appeal to the case of Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence and the International Court of Justice advisory opinion in 2010 that it was in accordance with international law so that you can, in fact, uh, unilaterally declare independence. This was the case of Kosovo. The uh, a jurist uh, writing the white book of uh, the Catalan transition um, stressed the right of a permanent minority that is being unjustly treated by the state to exercise uh, the right uh, of self-determination. When a national or territorial minority of a democratic state experiences the systematical violation by the central state of its reasonable aspirations to self-government and the agreements of territorial autonomy, this is a quote of the White Book, uh, then the only solution is to access full sovereignty. This is a juridical argument based on another kind of evidence, that of an existing national or territorial minority whose collective rights are systematically violated within a state. The coupling of national and territorial argument produces ambiguity as to the actual constituents uh, whose aspirations and rights are being violated. So as to who is collectively being defined as the people, you know. The juridical argument is that these are fundamental universi uh, universal rights regarding the freedom of the Catalan people and hence are of a higher juridical and moral order than the Spanish Constitution. So uh, these uh, legal arguments are uh, uh, really uh, also um, being, um, being uh, produced by, um, 
the pro-independence uh, uh, partisans. So um, now, uh, this is another uh, thing. I, I want to uh, speak about leg legitimacy as opposed to legality. Uh, and, and this legitimacy in the pro-independence in the uh, side of the argument uh, is all about the people. So it's the politics of the people. That's what gives legitimacy to the uh, uh, right uh, to claim for uh, an independent uh, and sovereign uh, state. And our, so an important argument for those supporting uh, independence is the, that legitimacy trumps legality. Indeed, it is impossible to legally declare independence within the present constitutional order. Thus, the force of right needs to be based on legitimacy of the popular will. But what is the popular will? What kind of majority expresses the popular will? How is the will of the minority valued and protected? These are the issues that are being debated through media discourse and mobilizations in present day Catalonia. But first, a word of caution. All the massive demonstrations, and we will see some photographs, uh, have become the norm in the nationalist debate. What is less obvious is that these demonstrations have completely displaced and silenced the massive protests against austerity that took place from 2011 to 2013 in Catalonia as in the rest of Spain. The argument that the fiscal deficit with the state is responsible for the cuts to public services in Catalonia uh, implicitly presupposes and sometimes explicitly exposes that the end of austerity will come with an independent Catalan state. Because, you know, the fault is uh, Madrid and Roma, no? Um, if we look at the map of revenue per capita and the incidence of independent votes in Catalonia, uh, and I have here some, well, this is one of these massive uh, demonstrations. This is the first one, the 2010 uh, demonstration after the uh, judicial ruling uh, that truncated the Estatut de Autonomia. And then we will see uh, some other ones. But here, uh, uh, here what we see in this uh, picture, this is the last uh, uh, elections, autonomous elections, uh, of December and 21, uh, and um, basically, and, uh, uh, no, these are December 2017, uh, basically what we see is that in, uh, um, in the Catalan uh, parliament, there is also a, a kind of disjuncture, very slight disjuncture, I must say, uh, between the votes and the seats in the parliament. So the votes are always slightly under 50%, and the seats are always slightly above 50%. So this also creates a, a, an issue. And uh, what you can see here also is that uh, in the uh, corner where you see the map of Catalonia, uh, uh, you can see uh, which areas of Catalonia, which regions of Catalonia vote more for independence and which regions vote a little bit less. So basically, it's a, a kind of Brexit situation where the rural areas, the more rural areas, so to speak, uh, vote more for independence and the more urban and industrial areas vote less for independence. Let's put it that way, no? Um, so uh, if we look at the map uh, of revenue per capita and the incidence of independent votes in Catalonia, we get an image similar to that of the Brexit uh, voters in the UK. Lower revenue areas, in this case mostly rural agricultural ones, which have been extremely dependent on redistributed, redistributive transfers uh, from the Catalan government for years are the strongest supporters, although 
often these funds that they were getting uh, were EU funds that came via the state and then via the autonomous government. Uh, what is the evidence then for a majority that would sustain um, legitimacy of the Declaration of Independence? It is the evidence of numbers first, but which numbers count is debatable. For example, in the last two plebiscitary elections, the, uh, this is uh, the, the photo that you have here, the discrepancy between majority of seats in parliament for secessionist party and the majority of votes for, no, for non-secessionist parties renders the claim of majority vulnerable. So basically, it's a very, um, not very clear majority, to say the least. During the two referendums, and here we have the first one uh, uh, of November 9, 2014 and October 1, 2017, the resounding majority in favor of independence, 80% in the first one and 90% uh, I uh, know this is the elections of 2050. I thought it was the referendum. Um, uh, the uh, came at the expense of a low turnout, respectively 36 and 43%. Likewise, the massive demonstrations of, uh, uh, this is the referendum, the last referendum. So you see that really the 90%, the, 90.2% um, 90 um, is huge, but also the turnout is not so big. And here we have one of these massive demonstrations of September 11. Uh, uh, all, they are always described by the media as gathering one million participants. One million is like uh, the, the, the way the, it's, it's always presented and are arguably a popular expression of support. But they are far from representing all the Catalan population or even a majority. They are nevertheless put forward by supporters of independence and by um, international media as, as being a clear expression of the will of the Catalan people, like everybody. Uh, and I think that here we have a metonym uh, which is treating uh, a part of the Catalan population as representing the totality, so the Catalan people, and not you know <clears throat> even most Catalan people or a part of Catalan people. No, it's everybody. So the metonym is often treated as a fact, and that's I think important, as evidence, as factual evidence in the struggle for legitimacy. So it's legitimate because it's everybody, and and here you have you know the clear. Um, image of this legitimacy. Catalan people as a whole support independence and as a whole hold nationalistic grievances against the Spanish state. Uh, although this position is repeated in discourses and the media, first here we have, uh, this is quite an interesting uh, study um, by a statistician at the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona uh, where you can see, uh, you know, like these million, uh, a million demonstrators are obviously not a million, uh, but uh, the um, estimates uh, are very different. If you look at what the government estimates are, which is the blue dots, and what the uh, Catalan government estimates are, which are the red dots. And in the middle, you know, like, um, you have what the, uh, um, the statistician has calculated, which is a, uh, nevertheless a, a very important turnout. Of, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, around at least seven, uh, 700,000 people that turn out every year on September 11. Obviously, they are organized to turn out, but um, we will speak about that uh, in a minute. Although this position 
of this metonym of the, the part as a whole of the Catalan people is repeated in discourses and the media, in reality, the leaders of the national transition process in a strategic document, which is used by the judge who is instructing the case, um, and which is, you know, uh, um, so the, the uh, uh, Catalan uh, uh, nationalists uh, say that this is not a real document, but, you know, like it's, uh, it's at least a, uh, presented as evidence in the trial. Uh, and I think it's very interesting. I, I personally think it's real, but I mean, I don't know. I, it's under, under review. Uh, although this position is represented in discourses and the media, in reality, the leaders of the national transition process in these strategic documents called enfocats, which means focused, uh, are clearly aware that they do not have a social majority support. And one of their main objectives, and this has been also very explicitly um, said by uh, some of the Esquerra Republicana, so the Catalan uh, Republican left leaders, uh, they are saying that they, don't, they have to widen the social base, what they call the social base. So they are aware that they do not have a social majority support, and the main objective is precisely to widen the social base. And in this document, the population of Catalonia is ranked on a continuum according to their degree of support for the independence cause and to the tactics required to convince them fully that this is a good cause. Hence, the evidence of numbers of actual popular support is interpreted in different ways by the strategists, depending on whether they are performing the metonym of a majority for the media and the general public, the metonym of a people, you know, or whether they are analyzing the necessary tactics to gain a real social majority. The metonym of the Catalan people has an additional consequence, the corporatist expression of a homogeneous nation welded in a transcendent identity recognition claim. Massive demonstrations and the ubiquity of symbols such as the Catalan inde independence uh, start flag uh, Estelada, hide a complex reality where identities are often tied to histories of migration and class differentiation. Supporters of uh, independence describe the humiliation they have suffered historically at the hands of Spanish governments. Their fight for dignity is tied to achieving sovereignty. From a very different experience, the migrants that came to Catalonia in the 1960s from the poorer regions of Spain have ambivalent feelings as they recall the humiliation they suffered as second class citizens, charnegos. But they are grateful at the same time for the economic opportunities of social mobility that the local industry provided them. The second generation uh, of these immigrants, born and raised in Catalonia and educated in Catalan speaking public schools, often feel they have a dual identity. They are Catalan Spaniards. If we look at a map of voters supporting what the Catalan media call unionist parties, uh, the coincidence with the immigrant working class of the urban periphery is striking. This is the, the opposite of the, what I was saying before. It's the same, no? Um, in the present conjuncture, these voters who used to favor social democratic or socialist parties are, not, are, are now voting on the grounds of national identity positioning. That is, they are now mostly voting against secession. And this is really very sad, I think. So uh, the so-called unionists have been mostly silent uh, until recently surrendering the floor of public space to uh, uh, mobilization uh, of public space mobilizations um, to independent supporters. 
but they, uh, however, they organized uh, several uh, uh, massive um, uh, uh, demonstrations in October 20, 2017, so before the declaration of, of independence. In this context, the battle for legitimacy through numbers is linked to the tacit evidence of different experiences that have historically produced complex identities and many declensions of the Catalan people. As evidentiary proof of nationalist spirit, however, numbers are moralized and citizens ranked into good or bad, pushing towards corporatist and exclusionary identities both in Catalonia and in Spain. And, you know, um, if you had been in Madrid uh, before 2017 and after 2017, the amount of Spanish flags that you can see in Madrid now uh, were not there before. You know, there was a huge flag that the Partido Popular had put in the Plaza Colón, but that was about it. You know, uh, that was not, but now, it's, you know, there is this both nationalist kind of identity um, thing going on. So, uh, and I'm finishing, <laughs> I'm sorry to be. Uh, evident struggles are also fought in terms of symbolic performances. Uh, and I want to stress this, both the symbolic and the performative part of this. Uh, those most frequently used by independent supporters, uh, the symbolic aspect, refer to past historical memories of the Spanish War of Succession, 1714, the Spanish Civil War, political exile, and political repression during the dictatorship and transition years. Less frequently, reference is made to major international figures of national liberation, such as Gandhi or Mandela. These references seek to create emotional connections that will reinforce legitimacy by providing evidence of a long history of human and political rights viola violations against Catalonia. But they do not go uncontested. A common rejoinder points to the incommensurability of the comparison. So how can you compare South Africa uh, with Catalonia? I mean, it's really a little bit out of place. Um, or even to intentional misrepresentations of the past. The Spanish Civil War, the dictatorship and the transition, however, are still very present memories in Spain. Uh, and the transition period was simultaneously a continuation of the Francoist regime, a recuperation of the political status quo ante of the Republic, and an attempt to become a modern democratic European nation. So very different things at the same time were going on. But stories about families' political positioning during the war, about their politics during the dictatorship and during the struggles of the transition are still references that divide the political moralities of people. So people still refer to, oh, his father was a fascist, oh, his father was in prison during the, that kind of positions people, and, and very, very uh, much uh, uh, politicians. So using symbolic connections to the past is an extremely uh, useful way to legitimate or delegitimate actions. It also contributes to positioning present actions within an emotionally charged political lineage. An example of this is the construction of the former president of the Generalitat, the one that escaped into exile, um, as the legitimate government in exile. And his followers insisted that he is still the legitimate president. So they are making a parallel between the application of Article 155 of the Constitution that dissolved the Catalan Parliament after the Declaration of Independence and the flight of the Republican Generalitat in the 1938 or 1939, uh, escaping the Francoist troops. 
the designation of the free space of Brussels as the seat of the legitimate Catalan government, the creation of the Council of the Republic and of the Assembly of Representatives that would operate in parallel uh, to an executive legal Catalan government in Catalonia. This is things that have been happening in February of 2018. I mean, and, and similar things continue happening. Is a creative reference to the parallel government of the Generalitat in exile during the dictatorship. On a different front, uh, performances such as the massive uh, uh, September 11 demonstrations are evidence of the peaceful character of Catalan mobilizations for independence. Uh, but I here can, want to show you that these uh, massive demonstrations are very well organized. I mean, they are not spontaneous at all. You know, this is the 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 space is is uh, um, fragmented into different uh, subspaces, and each space is to be occupied by people coming coming for a, from a particular region of Catalonia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this, you know, this this organization is basically um, the making of the uh, uh, Asamblea Nacional de Catal Catalana, no? Uh, so uh, these massive demonstrations, and here we have one of the latest demonstrations. This is the, uh, the one just before the referendum, uh, but after the uh, September uh, laws of uh, referendum and transition had been voted by the parliament. Um, um, so these, uh, they, they are always uh, uh, presented as evidence of uh, a very peaceful and democratic movement and about, uh, the, which is non-violent. This is uh, um, defined as the smiling revolution. Uh, and violence is, is a feature of the Spanish state and questions its democratic credentials. That's how it's always presented, no? These, image of the demos peacefully making a legitimate claim in the street, claiming the public space of the nation and embodying freedom of expression is a message to the world. There is only one legitimate demos and we are, we are it. There is no doubt that supporters of independence are extremely successful in the performative aspect of the evidence struggle over legitimacy especially in its international projection. projection. Meanwhile, the state hides behind the judicialization of the conflict and is at pains to uphold legitimacy in the face of continuous performances of historical grievances and Catalan people's will. One of these symbolic performances, uh, here we have you know, the right to vote, uh, it's the same uh, demonstration. Uh, here we have uh, an, um, uh, a demonstration by the so-called unionists, so the ones who are uh, not uh, pro-independence, but it's also very symbolic, you know, the two flags and, and we are both Catalan and Spanish and so on. Uh, but uh, here we have another very interesting, uh, I think, um, leaflet uh, before the uh, uh, December elections of 2017 where uh, the pro-independence uh, parties are uh, presenting uh, the uh, voters of independence as, you know, like uh, standing upright and uh, the voters of the other parties as kneeling uh, in front of the uh, central state. But what I want to show you, this is another symbolic um, expression that uh, relates to a Franco, to Franco, uh, in fact, not Franco, to uh, the um, uh, repression of, uh, of, um, of a theater uh, uh, presentation in, during the transition. And, you know, it was, uh, anyway, what I want to speak uh, about is these, uh, these performance, because it's very, I think, strong 
performance. One of the symbolic performances took place during the Easter holiday in March-April of 2018. On March 30, groups of independent supporters planted yellow cross crosses in several beaches in the province of Girona. The crosses had words such as freedom, democracy, republic, equality, solidarity, and justice, symbolizing the death of liberty and other political virtues. The committees in defense of the republic a civil society group that has organized most of the symbolic performances, such as the tying of ye yellow ribbons all over Catalonia, asking for the freeing of political prisoners. Uh, so these committees were responsible for the planting of the crosses in this action. Uh, and in this action, they included the beach of Argelès-sur-Mer, which is this beach that we see in the bottom part and they are planting the crosses there. Uh, and Argelès-sur-Mer is in France, and it's an area that the Catalan nationalists call Northern Catalonia, and where Spanish Civil War refugees were held in a concentration camp in February of 1939. And you have the photograph, uh, uh, the upper part of the photograph is the concentration camp in the beach of uh, Argelès-sur-Mer in 1939. So the action was clearly meant to recall this past, this past event of the you know, refugees and to make parallels between repression and fascism then and its alleged repetition in the present, forcing the flight into exile and imprisoning those that fought for the Catalan Republic and for national freedom. However, this was not well received by everybody, and especially by people whose skin had crossed to France and ended in Argelès in 1939. And uh, just to mention uh, an example, um, in a tweet, Patricia, an ordinary Catalan citizen, comments this action, this action as follows. My mother's family uh, were socialist miners from Andalusia, and they ended at Argelès in the winter of 1939. Today, those that consider us inferior and call us colonial settlers, and this is real, I mean, they call the immigrants colonial settlers, uh, use that suffering. They are shameless, and that's the tweet. Uh, in conclusion, Different kinds of evidence are used to argue, justify, and mobilize political action. But the evidence is about truth, direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, and testimonies about present and past injustice are all contending in the arena, arena of factual truth-making and foreclosing the possibility of pluralist interpretations up for public debate. While some render the Constitution and its definition of Spain as the only sovereign nation a dogma of faith, others present the nature of Catalan people as an essential truth. In the struggle, truth, opinion, and ideology become equivalent and democratic pluralism unviable. The struggle is about making factual truth unassailable through evidence. It is not a struggle about contestable interpretation and opposing projects. Thus, it is about the capture of politics by truth-making struggles that attempt to render a particular political project incontestably self-evident. I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you.